Hi, oh, yeah. this is Glenno, people, and uh, yeah, I know you haven't heard from me for a while. I've uh, been, you know, a bit busy uh, with work and uh, doing geometry, uh, working out uh, the um, the drop over certain distances um, over Earth curvature. Yeah, because that's what normal people do, working out drop over curvature. All right, geometry. All right. Something everyone hates at school and thinks that they'll never use and here I am doing it at the age of 44 I'm just like sitting there doing this geometry, right? And I've been reading uh, physics books. I've been reading uh, like uh, Isaac Newton's Prince of Beer So anyway, I'm, so, so I'm sitting there uh, Doing me geometry at the table, right? And I get a knock on a door and uh I was thinking it was a friend of mine or something, and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll go and answer, because that's the polite thing to do, right? And uh, I opened the door, and I, I'm a bit surprised, because there's these two uh, Mormon dudes, right? These two missionaries standing at my door. And uh, before they could even get a chance to uh, to uh, show me their Book of Mormon, I, uh, I said, uh, you guys... Um, any of you guys know anything about geometry? And the Filipino guy's like, yeah, I, I know how to do geometry. I'm like, okay, I've got a problem for you to solve. And they're like, all right, that sounds cool. So uh, so the following piece is uh, basically what transpired, right? I went and grabbed my uh, papers and equations and things I've been working on. and uh, And this is basically what happened, right? Okay, so uh, I was just uh, trying to show them this problem. Uh, excuse the drawings, they're pretty primitive looking, like a two-year-old draw, draw them with its mouth, you know. But, uh, and then also, uh, excuse the fact that I've gone over some earlier cal calculations, I've drawn over them, so it's a bit messy, but uh, you'll get the general gist, all right. So I was showing these Mormon dudes, uh, this ge geometry problem I was having <clears throat> of transferring a uh, a spherical geometry problem to an oblate spheroid, right? And uh, they said beforehand that they could help me, and now once I showed them the problem, they're like, oh, sorry, we, we've got no idea how to help you with that one. I'm like, yeah, no, that's cool. You know, not everyone's like Isaac Newton or something. So anyway, um, then I started drawing... Uh, I drew the uh, the Earth's apparent orbit around the sun, right? And got a little drawing of the Earth there going around the sun. And it's got the aphelion, which is uh, the furthest point away from the sun, which is about 94, 000, uh, 94 million miles away, sorry. And the perihelion, which is approximately 91 million miles away in front of it, All right? Uh, which gives us an average of around about 93 million miles uh, distance from the sun. Okay? <clears throat> now, I try to explain to them, all right, that <clears throat> in order for us to uh, maintain uh, angular momentum, uh, we'd have to keep a sort of constant speed, right? Uh, or constant velocity, or even constant acceleration, etc. And they're like, yep, yeah, we agree with that. So as you can see on this uh, diagram, you can see the uh, the Earth, and I've written there that it's revolving at around about 1,000 and uh, 1,039 miles per hour, uh, which is pretty easy. You just sort of like uh, um, use the uh, circumference of the equator and then you uh, divide that by 24 hours and that gives you approximately 1039 to 1043 miles per hour that any spot on the equator you'd be traveling at right so they say yeah yep yep about a thousand miles an hour yep, yep cool uh, and then i said well and on, on top of that uh we're uh orbiting the sun right uh so in a, in a whole year, it takes a whole year to orbit the sun, right? Now, if you take the um, mean distance from the sun, 
you know, it has a radius of uh, 93 million miles. And then you uh, take that figure and multiply it by 2 pi. Uh, you get uh, 584,336,212.74 miles that we're doing in uh, 365.25 days, right? So not only are we uh, rotating at uh, 1,039 miles per hour, we're also uh, rapidly moving around the sun in an orbit, elliptical orbit around the sun, right? Uh, approximately 66,659.39 miles per hour, right? That's what averages out to the average speed. It's uh, 66,659.39 miles per hour. And they're like, yep, yep, cool, yep. Yeah, we're, we're, yep, that's right. Okay. Now that's, that's, that's calculating it at the sun being in a state of rest, right? The problem with the whole theory is the fact that the sun is um, apparently moving. And it was Galileo who uh, came across this discovery uh, by looking at uh, sunspots. And determining that it was, he determined that it was moving. And so they've calculated it to uh, be moving at around about 483,000 miles an hour. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. And sort of orbiting the Milky Way, and, and, and that's all orbiting uh, the Great Attractor, <clears throat> right, etc. And so I said, okay. So the aphelion is the furthest distance we are away from it in our orbit. So in order to catch up with it, we'd have to accelerate, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's all like, you know, you're going to overtake a truck that's going 100 kilometers an hour safely on a road. You want to be going faster than the truck. You wouldn't want to be sitting next to it. Otherwise, it's going to smash into you as it goes into the merge lane, right? So um, you have to go. You have to be going faster than the truck, okay? And that's the same here. If the, if the Earth is not going to sort of ram into the sun, it would have to be going faster than the sun, which is uh, 483,000 miles per hour, right? <clears throat> In order to get to the perihelion, which is the closest distance to the sun. And then as we go around there and go back towards the aphelion, we're apparently uh, decelerating. So we're going slower again. So I said, how is that possible, right? <clears throat> how is it possible that we could be accelerating uh, to more than uh, uh, 483,000 uh, miles per hour while rotating at 1,039 approximately miles per hour? right um and not feel it they're like oh space and i said oh, okay we'll keep going with this all right so the kobe uh satellite or kobe or whatever you want to call him this satellite they apparently sent up in 1989 uh, it sort of measured our, uh, our 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 velocity or our speed uh uh, in relation to, or uh, you know, in ref with, with with the point of reference being um, the the apparent radiation from the Big Bang, right? And they have estimated that uh, we're pretty much going at uh, 242.3865 miles per second, right? Yep, you you, you heard right, right? 242.3865 miles per second, which gives us 872,000. 591.4 miles per hour so that's how fast it calculates that we are traveling at okay so if we're moving at roughly 80 872,591 miles per hour as well as rotating at 1000 miles per hour why aren't we feeling it and they're like oh space and i say okay well this actually defies what isaac newton had observed you see he observed that uh because of it the earth's rotation and the actions and the, uh, of the sun and the moon upon it 
uh, even though this is all in space and from 93 million miles away. <laughs> uh, apparently, the equator is expanding and the poles are being squashed together it's just slightly um causing us to become more of an ablate spheroid and they're like yep yep we understand that that's what he said right yeah cool so <clears throat> how does that work if you're in space when apparently your movement doesn't get uh, isn't affected right doesn't affect you then how is it possible that it could affect the mass of the equator? Like, most of the equator is basically made up of heavy mass, land mass, right? How is that expanding? How is that affected, but we're not affected? How is the centrifugal force affecting l large land mass, but is not affecting human beings, right? They're like, oh, wow. Yeah, we... And then I tried... As you can see by this next picture, I tried to show them a, you know, a picture of what they try to teach us at school. You know, they get the bucket and they fill it with water and they say, okay, you know, spin this bucket and uh, we'll show you what centripetal force and gravity is all about. So we're spinning this bucket and we're like, wow, the water stays in the bucket, right? It just happens to stay in the bucket. Well, the only centripetal for force that's in that bucket that's keeping it bound to the center is the bottom of the bucket and so I drew this picture and I, then I drew and I said how about if we drew holes in the bottom of this bucket what would happen if we swung a bucket of, of water around us right with holes in the bottom of the bucket what would happen and they said well water would go everywhere I said yes that's right okay water would come you know, soaring out the holes in the bottom of the bucket. You know, not even our atmosphere would be able to, like, um, keep it in. I uh, said, uh, so why is it, how is it possible that we could be spinning and moving at this kind of velocity and uh, the oceans aren't just flinging off this imaginary, imaginary ball, right? And they're like, oh, we don't know. And I said, well, of course. I said, now imagine a gravitron. So you can see my picture of a gravitron is pretty uh, scientific. And I said, Are you, how fast do you think this is rotating, like the inside of this? And they said, well, we don't know. I said, well, it's it's approximately like uh, 45 to 46 feet uh, in circumference, like on the inside, right? And it uses 44 panels of about a foot wide. Okay, now I did, and it does 24 uh, revolutions per minute. It gets up to about 24 revolutions a minute, which means that at any point in that gravitron, here, listen to this, at any point in that, if you, if any point of that gravitron, you will be travelling at about 12 and a half miles per hour. That's right, 12.5 miles per hour, which is nothing, right? <laughs> And I said, but imagine chucking, and as you can see, I've got the gravitron on the back of a truck, right? It's kind of funny. <laughs> and I said, imagine it was on the back of a truck, and it was moving, and you're in the inside. And this truck was also doing circle work, right? Doing some big elliptical circle thing. I said, how much centrifugal force uh, would that create? And they, and they just... They just look dumbfounded, right? So I'm sitting there saying, look, what happens when you're on the gravitron or anything like that? Do you fall toward... Wh which direction do you fall? Fall, And then one of them sort of goes, oh, I fall towards the centre. I said, I, I, do you? And he says, no, actually, yeah, you, you pulled away from it. And I said, that's true. You see, a spinning object will, will create centrifugal f uh, motion, which means you'll be... Um, you'll be uh, taken away from the center of the rotation, not pulled towards it. It's not, there's no centripetal force. There's, there would be only centrifugal, right? And even more so if it was on the back of a truck. Okay, so that, that's, that's those drawings in a nutshell, uh, trying to explain to these guys about uh, 
centrifugal versus centripetal force and how it's a lot of bogus rot, right? And how we could not be possibly spinning and traveling around the sun, which is traveling around the Milky Way, which is traveling towards uh, an even bigger system, right? Anyway, so I was just trying to tell them that and we spoke for about half an hour, right? And uh, then they said, oh, we'll come back. I don't know if they'll come back. You know, I'm not sure if they'll come back, but they said they would and they'll talk more about it. But uh, I even invited them, eh? I said, uh, look, see that car there? That's my car. I invite any, either of you to stand on the roof while I do some circle work and we'll see whether you fall towards the, uh, the engine or whether you fall towards the back end of the car, away from the car. <clears throat> And they're like, nah, nah, we're good. Ha! <laughs> nah, we're good. Nah, we're good. You know, they didn't even have the balls to stand on the roof of my car while I was doing circle work. I mean, what kind of scientists are these people, right? So as you can guess, I was, uh, I was pretty bummed that they weren't willing to sacrifice their limbs for the sake of science, right? Okay. But uh, I'm no, I'm pretty sure I'll get over it. But let's get back to what I was uh, sort of talking about in the introduction, right? <clears throat> about uh, Isaac Newton and his uh, book Principia. Yeah, it's got a lot longer title than that in Latin, right? Mathematical principles of philosophy or something. All right. So anyway. We're sitting there, uh, sitting there reading this thing. I'll show you the cover, right? It looks like this. And as you can see, uh, this book is pretty heavy, right? But this is what I've been reading while I've been doing all my geometrical equations, okay? <clears throat> Excuse my throat, it's a bit sore at the moment. Uh, just haven't coming down with a cold, but that's okay. Bit of cold weather never hurt anyone, All right? So anyway, he came out with his theory of gravity. Okay, it's about gravity. This book, and he came out with his theory uh, to try and explain Kepler's ideas. All right, that uh, how the uh, the planets apparently do, and including Earth, apparently do uh, elliptical orbits around the sun, and uh, that. Uh, they, um, one of the laws of this uh, theory was that um, they had to sweep out equal areas uh, in equal amounts of time, okay? And that they had to continue to maintain a uh, constant uh, angular momentum, all right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, in, uh, in his... Uh, Author's preference, preface, uh, <clears throat> Newton writes, I hope the principles here laid down will afford some light either to this or some truer method of philosophy. See, he did have some doubts about this. No, he had some loose ends that he, 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 needed, he needed to tie up and he sort of really couldn't. But he tried to leave it to, he wanted to leave it to better people. Not necessarily better, but people who him down the track might have uh, accumulated this knowledge this extra knowledge and been able to look at it in a different light and uh, given a more truer account of what was happening so anyway that's what i'm seeking to do so in in his axioms which is one of the chapters axioms or laws of motion the very first law of motion states every body perseveres in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed thereon. You see, this is why he came up with the idea that we must be an oblate spheroid, okay? Because uh, the sun and the moon and our own rotation is uh, pulling at the uh, equator, causing us to bulge at the equator and uh, sort of get squashed just slightly at the uh, poles, okay? And I think he saw the problem with this. <clears throat> that if the sun and the moon were able to do this sort of thing to us, then of course it's going to uh, 
uh, change our state, all right? And therefore, most likely have an effect on our uniform motion and our right line, right? It's going to affect that. But anyway, because of this oblate state that we're apparently in, right, he, he, came, he, he theorized that uh, at the equator, gravity is lighter than it is at the poles, okay? And some of the experiments that he uh, sort of did to uh, try and find this out, and he, it doesn't sound very scientific, but it sounds quite crazy, really, all right? Um, he used a pendulum, right? <clears throat> so they'd get a pendulum and they'd sit it next to a clock or they'd time it or something and they'd get a chicken, right? And uh, they'd, if they'd time it and they'd see how far it deviated from a certain time or whatever and, uh, and determine how much gravity is acting on it, right? I mean... Uh, to find out if gravity was working or not working, if it was heavier at one place than another, then uh, I could think of better things than a pendulum, yeah? I mean, in those days, they might not have had dumbbells or anything, but they would have had, like, weights and scales, right? For commerce and trade and stuff, they would have had weights. They could have just grabbed a weight. They could have grabbed a scale, right? They could have gone to Ecuador, and they could have weighed it there, then they could have like sailed over to freaking Russia or something and then they could have weighed the same thing with the same the same uh, the same scales and if it was out then they could prove their theory but they didn't do this they used a pendulum okay and uh, they, they, they they discovered that uh, gravity was lighter at the equator okay but then someone wrote to him and said you know like Dude, pendulums are made of metal, you know, and uh, they're uh, susceptible to fluctuation. So, you know, like you have it in a colder climate, uh, it's going to constrict, right? So the metal will uh, shorten, thereby giving it a, uh, a quicker swing than if you were to take it to a uh, moderately uh, warmer weather or tropical you know, where the the metal would expand, causing it to uh, tick slower. So it, it would it would affect the uh, the outcome of this uh, experiment, right? And of course, he sort of put put this in the back of his book. You know, <clears throat> he sort of it, uh, acknowledged that that was one of the problems. And another one of the problems was that uh, Paris, which is about 48 uh, degrees plus, you know, ab above the equator, that Paris itself was uh, experiencing uh, lesser gravity, according to pendulums. OK, so it doesn't sound very scientific. As I said, I'd, I'd rather grab a 10 kilogram dumbbell nowadays. I'd grab a 10 kilogram dumbbell. I would uh, weigh it in Australia, then I'd take it to Ecuador, and I'd weigh it there, and if there was any fluctuation, then that would prove their theory right. If there wasn't any fluctuation, then it goes to prove it's rubbish, okay? <clears throat> but, you know, if their theory was right, then there wouldn't be a uniform 10-kilogram dumbbell on Earth. There wouldn't be a... a there wouldn't be a uniform 10 kilograms. That means that if I was to get 10 kilograms of meat in Australia and try to sell it in Ecuador as 10 kilograms, they wouldn't buy it because it weighed 9.5 kilograms. They'd say, you, you're robbing us. Okay, so, so the, the whole so-called global marketing thing, right, wouldn't work. It wouldn't work because everything would weigh different right so that's one indication of why i think this is rubbish okay i call bullshit all right so anyway moving right along another reason why i sort of really have a problem with this whole idea right is as i stated uh, to these guys that uh, we're moving apparently around the uh the sun at uh 
incredible speeds <clears throat> right which is moving itself at 483,000 uh, miles per hour towards the greater tractor which is itself moving towards shapely supercluster take a look at this picture right Yeah, that's right. This ship, this sh shapely or shapely supercluster, <clears throat> is apparently the biggest thing in the universe at the moment, right? So we're we're all revolving around it, while well, revolving around the sun, you know. And lucky for me in Australia, this uh, supercluster just happens to be sort of like in my sky, right, right above my house. I'm looking above my house. And I see the freaking Milky Way and I see uh, the Norma Cluster and right up there is the Shapely Supercluster. So I'm, we're actually going south first to the Supercluster, right? And it's right above me, so lucky me, right? Okay, Th this is this is what I, 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 I don't think is, is, is right, right, okay? With, is that the, the, the fact that we're moving at this such great a velocity toward this thing, right? We'd have to be. Right, if we use the Shapely Supercluster as a point of reference, um, and if it's moving itself around another universe or something else or another cluster, then our speed, uh, our speed does uh, exponentially increase, okay? Now, going back to the original point, if that was the case, it, okay, the equator and the, the the land masses around the equator, if they are bulging because of our rotation and everything else, right? Then we should uh, we should experience the effect or the influence of this. Okay, we should experience it. For them to say that we don't is rubbish. Okay, you can't say cause gravity. Like so many people say, right? Everyone's like, you know, everyone's answer is cause gravity, <laughs> right? Cause gravity. Why did? Do, why don't we feel this cause gravity? Why are we still on the earth? Cause gravity. I, I, I've explained. You know, anything that's operating in a circular sort of motion is going to ca cause centrifugal force. And the very fact they pointed this out in regards to. Uh, the, uh, the equator, you know, the centrifugal force is actually acting on the centripetal force, which means uh, that gravity is lighter there. See, that goes to prove, right, that there is centrifugal force that would be operating on us. We'd be flown off the planet at that kind of velocity, okay? And the fact that uh, uh, we're, we're not only just going at a uniform speed, we're actually accelerating from the aphelion to the perihelion, okay? We'd have to be. <clears throat> and that's if we were sort of doing this orbit that was sort of going from behind the sun to in front of the sun and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it even gets even more complicated, right? It gets even more complicated when you, uh, when you have a, 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 a sort of vortexal orbit, right? Where you've got this... Uh, Orbit that's going uh, sort of uh, what's a vertical sort of uh, orbit around the sun, okay? Because not only are we having to like go from the aphelion and accelerate to the perihelion, so we'd be doing really fast speeds uh, in a vertical sort of fashion. We'd also be uh, going uh, horizontally or laterally, right, to keep up with the sun, okay? And on top of that, the moon would be also uh, having to do the same thing in order to keep up with us. So it's all rubbish, okay? It's all rubbish, all right? Now, if you uh, if you don't believe me, well, uh, all right, let's just uh, take take a look at this picture, okay? We'll take a picture. Look, Take a look at this picture of uh, the Earth. It's a computer-generated image of uh, of Earth, and uh, and I've compared it here to uh, Russia's picture from space. Well, apparently from space, right? 
Now this is uh, the first picture is one of Earth uh, that that uh, it's sort of been modelled after what the science, how the scientists and the physicists have sort of described it, right? It's an ablate spheroid that uh, that uh, is more a bit of a bit more of a pear shape, right? Whereas the other one down below looks like just a uh, like a glamorised version of the uh, blue marble that NASA came up with, okay? <clears throat> Which is was was also a CGI picture, okay? All right. Now the first one sort of looks like a CGI picture on the bottom there. It looks like a CGI picture. The top one, the second one, it looks like a a uh, mouldy sort of rotten potato that's been. Uh, thrown in the wash with a tie-dye shirt okay <clears throat> it, it doesn't even look like a planet okay we couldn't even live on it we couldn't live on it and we certainly couldn't live on it if that was trying to like accelerate around the sun it wouldn't happen okay you know if you're looking at this sort of stuff and they're saying this is science you know they're talking rubbish okay i mean start thinking for yourselves people all right, don't sit there and say, well, you know, uh, science, you know, because uh, gravity. And don't go sitting there saying, oh, you only believe in geocentric or flat earth because uh, cause of religion and stuff. That's rubbish, mate. Just have a look at it, okay? Like, um, you look at... Uh, for instance, what Isaac Newton said about, like, atheists, okay? He says, uh, opposition to godliness is atheism in profession and idolatry in practice. Atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. So don't go trying to, like, um, defend... Uh, scientists when they say that sort of stuff about atheists okay <laughs> all right here you are saying gravity and saying that flat earth is all about like um, religion right and yet you have this guy who you champion as the champion of gravity and ablate spheroids and stuff and he's basically saying that atheists are stupid okay and they're a blight to humanity. All right. So don't go defending someone who's not going to defend you, okay? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. All right. But I'm not here to sort of make enemies here. I'm just trying to point to the truth. All right. Get to the, get to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is basically that science has been telling us a lot of lies and a lot of rubbish, okay? And uh, just uh, encourage us all to get out there and do some research for yourself. Look into geocentricity, all right? Aristotle, look at, look up Aristotle and Ptolemy and and many others who have looked at different different uh, models of the Earth and of the universe. And do some thinking for yourself. Don't just accept what teachers tell you or what the scientists have tell you, or what the television tells you, you know? Don't get brainwashed. Start thinking for yourself. I hope you've seen sense of what I've said, right? I hope you've seen it and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, that's right, that that, that doesn't sound sensible. That doesn't make sense. That's not, co that's not uh, rational, okay? It doesn't make sense. All right, so start thinking for yourself, and 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 I think that by investigating these uh, these things, that I think you, I believe you will all grow, uh, grow an appreciation for the world you live in. Okay, I mean, there's nothing wrong with uh, appreciating the world you live in, and uh, appreciating the people that are in this world. All right, we're all brothers and sisters, and we should all all look out for each other and all respect one another. Okay. And, uh, yeah, just keep it real, people, and uh, stay tuned, because in my next video, I'm going to be looking at, uh, <clears throat> excuse my throat again, I'm going to be looking at flat earth math, okay, um, there's been a few accusations thrown at it, so I'm going to discuss that and show uh, how I work out uh, drop over curvature, okay, 
and uh, we're going to be discussing things I've looked at over long distances, all right, myself, because I've actually gone out and done this thing myself. I haven't just listened to what other people have said to me, okay? I mean, I used to be a heliocentrist, okay? I, I, I followed... <clears throat> excuse me, theologians and like Dr. Henry Morris, uh, who's a creation scientist, okay? He's the father of creation science. You know, I've read his Genesis record and I've even got his study Bible, you know. And uh, he's all for the heliocentric. And uh, and it was, only, it was only when I started looking into this stuff for myself, you know, that I saw... Uh, how wrong these people are you know even christians can be wrong okay so um look into yourself just as i have and i'm gonna continue to do this you know weather permitting all right all right keep it real and uh i'll see you next time god bless something that everyone hates at school and thinks that they'll never use and here I am doing it at the age of 44 and just like sitting there doing this geometry right and I've been reading uh, physics books I've been reading uh, like uh, Isaac Newton's Principia so anyway I'm, so, so I'm sitting there uh, doing me geometry at the table right and I get a knock on a door and uh I was thinking it was a friend of mine or something, and I thought, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go and answer, because that's the polite thing to do, right? And uh, I opened the door, and I, I'm a bit surprised, because there's these two uh, Mormon dudes, right? These two missionaries standing at my door. And uh, before they could even get a chance to, uh, to uh, show me their Book of Mormon, I, uh, I said, uh, you guys... Um, any of you guys know anything about geometry? And the Filipino guy's like, yeah, I, I know how to do geometry. I'm like, okay, I've got a problem for you to solve. And they're like, all right, that sounds cool. So uh, so the following piece is uh, basically what transpired, right? I went and grabbed my uh, papers and equations and things I've been working on. and uh, And this is basically what happened, right? Okay, so uh, I was just... Oh yeah, this is Glenno, people, and uh, yeah, I know you haven't heard from me for a while. 
I've uh, been, you know, a bit busy uh, with work and uh, doing geometry, uh, working out uh, the um, the drop over certain distances um, over Earth curvature. Yeah, because that's what normal people do, working out drop over curvature. All right, geometry. All right, just uh, trying to show them this problem, man. Excuse the drawings, they're pretty primitive looking, like a two-year-old drawing drawn with its mouth, you know. But, uh, and then also, uh, excuse the fact that I've gone over some earlier cal calculations, I've drawn over them, so it's a bit messy, but uh, you'll get the general gist, alright. So I was showing these Mormon dudes, uh, this ge geometry problem I was having, <clears throat> of transferring a... Uh, a spherical geometry problem to an oblate spheroid right and uh, they said beforehand that they could help me and now once I showed them the problem they're like oh sorry we, we've got no idea how to help you with that one I'm like